Murphy is given wow. class. Good to she see is you, a Bob. blessing. Hold it. <laughs> Rukmini Devi is given class. She is a blessing for all of us. She's seeing Krishna just everywhere and sharing Krishna through love and care. Turn on your camera. Please don't be shy. Shishirada Mulidara Ki Jai. Little poem to open it up. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> so grateful to be invited to speak in Bhakti Center Bhagavatam class and be with all of you. So here we are. Uh, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th Canto, 44th Chapter, and verses 44 through 51. These are the uh, wives of Kamsa and his brothers were speaking. Saya nam vira saya yam patima linga so chatihi vile pusu svaram nario visrejantio mahus shutaha. I'll just read that one, I guess, and then I'll read the English for the other ones. Embracing their husbands who lay on a hero's final bed. The sorrowful women loudly lamented while shedding constant tears. The women cried out, Alas, O master, O dear one, O knower of religious principles, O kind and compassionate protector of the shelterless, by your being slain, we have also been slain together with your household and off offspring. Text number 46. O great hero among men, bereft of you, its master, this city has lost its beauty, just as we have, with all festivity and good fortune within it, have come to an end. Text number 47. O dear one, you have been brought to this state because of the terrible violence you committed against innocent creatures. How can one who harms others attain happiness? Purport? Having expressed their sentimental grief, the ladies now speak practical wisdom. They are beginning to see things realistically because their minds were purified by the agony of the recent events and by the association of Lord Krishna. Text number 48. Lord Krishna causes the appearance and disappearance of all beings in this world, and he is the maintainer, their maintainer as well. One who disrespects him can never prosper happily. Text 49. Sukadev Goswami said, after consoling the royal ladies, Lord Krishna, sustainer of all the worlds, arranged for the prescribed funeral, funeral rites to be performed. Text 50. Then Krishna and Balaram released their mother and father from bondage and offered obeisances to them, touching their feet with their heads. Text 51, Devaki and Vasudev, now knowing Krishna and Balaram to be the lords of the universe, simply stood with joined palms, being apprehensive. They did not embrace their sons. So this is the end of the chapter. This is, says... Thus end the purports of the humble servants of his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, to the 10th canto, 44th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled The Killing of Kamsa. Let me chant a few prayers here before I begin. Om Gyananjana Salakaya Chaksum Hilatam Yen does my Shri Gurave Namaha. Shri Chaitanya Manu Vistam Stapitam Yen Abutale. Swayam Rupakadamai Hum Dadati Sapadantikam. Nama Hum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale. Shimate Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane. 
Namaste Saraswate Deve Goravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sanyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchaka Pataru Vyascha Kripa Shindu Vaivacha Patita Nam Pavane Vyo Vaishnavyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gora Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Sasya Stuvi Svasya Kalo Prasidatam Danyan to Bhutan in Shivam Nito Dia Manas Chabadram Bajata Radhuksaje Avishatam no Matirapia Hui to Kim. Thank you all for being here this morning at the Bhakti Center class. I'm so grateful to be here and to be invited by all of you. In these verses, it's a very interesting, uh, we have a, a very interesting dichotomy here. Um, we're hearing the lamentation of the wives of Kamsa and his brothers. So they're lamenting in grief. They're glorifying the ones that they loved as their protectors. They say, good fortune of our city has come to an end. It's lost its beauty, being bereft of you, its master. And then there's this interesting shift from what uh, the disciples of Prabhupada say in the purport, there's this shift from sentimentality to seeing things realistically by the association of Krishna. They say, you've committed violence against innocent creatures. How can one who harms others attain happiness? Then Krishna, even though Kamsa was his eminent sworn enemy, Krishna arranges, so graciously arranges for the funeral rites of his cruel uncle Kamsa, who tried to kill him in so many ways. Then Krishna and Balaram, they release their mother and father from bondage. So Devaki and Vasudev had been in prison for so many years, and they offer um, obeisances to their parents, touching their feet with their heads. Krishna and Balaram put their heads on the feet of their parents. And then the chapter ends with Vasudeva and Devaki. They're just frozen. They're just standing in awe and reverence, just standing with folded hands. They're, they're too apprehensive to embrace their sons, and they're too overwhelmed to even offer obeisances. So uh, I'd like to focus on this grieving mood of the wives of Kamsa and his brothers. It said that if people, sometimes it's said that if people were always in the mood, if we were always in the mood of those times when we're at a funeral, then we would all be realized souls. Um, once Lord, Lord Ram said to his brother Bharat, no man is free to act as he pleases in this world. The embodied soul is dragged here and there by the all-powerful force of providence no one can control that force. All gains will end in loss. Every meeting ends in separation, and all life has its end in death, as there is no fear for a ripe fruit other than to fall. So there is no fear for any man other than death. But we forget. Um, we forget, and we go back to our covered consciousness and it said that the most amazing thing in this world that we all see, we all hear about people every day who are dying all around us, and still we live and we act as though I will never die. I'm a woman, I'm a New Yorker, I'm an American, I'm educated, I'm accomplished, I have my degree in this field or that field, I have my social circle, my liberal values, my cherished beliefs, my New York Times, right? I got my New York Times, my family, my ethnic group, my lifelong goals. Um, but we see uh, everything shattered at the time of death, so unexpected. There's never a convenient time, right? 
I had so many more plans to complete. I remember once being at a funeral and uh, a friend of mine turned to me and said, this is so surreal. And yeah, it's so surreal because it's actually not real because death is not actually a reality. But we think um, our reality is this life, these loved ones. And when we think like that, then the pain is acute, right? When we're so tightly enmeshed and identified with this world, there is, there is so much pain. But our path of bhakti doesn't say, as other paths, the more impersonal paths claim that this world is false. On the path of bhakti, we understand that it's all coming from Krishna. So how could it be false? But it is temporary. Our lives in this world are temporary. And our illusion is that we think it's eternal. And that this life is my real home. This world is my real home. And all those people and possessions around me are my reality. Um, and so the fear for a devotee is, is the fear of coming back again. A serious devotee has a fear of coming back again into this cycle of repeated birth and death. So therefore, because of that kind of fear, they take their spiritual practice, the practice of bhakti, seriously. So these people in my life, my possessions, my home, my car, my New York Times, my everything, Srila Prabhupada calls them, or no, rather Srimad Bhagavatam calls them our fallible soldiers. So what does that mean? It means that I think that they will save me at the moment of my death. Um, my dear husband, my wife, my partner, my loving children, my education. Srila Prabhupada wrote a beautiful series of poems um, called Vrindavan Bhajan, where he talks about his relatives. Um, he, he says, those I, I consider to be my own people. He's saying, you know, this is in his old age, right? In, in the 1950s, just before coming to America, he's writing this. He says, now where are they all? They're all a list of names. And Srila Prabhupada was writing from the vantage point of time, from a vantage point of, of detachment. And awake, an awakened person, someone on the spiritual path, sees death as a change of dress. But when our whole identity is, is just enwrapped and enmeshed and thinking of myself and, and, my, and my people as mine, this body-mind persona, we don't, when we're so enmeshed, we don't step out, we don't step away to get this vantage perspective to see myself as outside of all of this, as an observer, someone who's passing through this world. So yeah, I was thinking that in the wisdom of humility, we can step back to observe, step away, step back to observe. The poet Rumi advises us, he says, he's speaking to Islamic people, right? So he says, forget your beard and self-importance. Be an invisible guide, like the scent of roses that shows where the inner garden is. So yeah, so what would it look like to be, Jesus says, to be in this world, but not of this world, right? So what would that look like, to, to keep some distance, to see myself and the world, the people around me with an observer's perspective, not an enmeshed perspective, right? To be so fixed in the reality of my spiritual practice that I'm not shaken when I experience different losses in this world. So here's a very um, profound quote from Srila Prabhupada's guru, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. He says, bear in mind that we are not the operators of instruments, but merely instruments ourselves. We must constantly offer our music at the lotus feet of Sri Guru. We should practice the work of being a preacher by carrying aloft the banner of Sri Gorashindar's divine commands. 
by perpetual submission to Sri Guru and the Vaishnavas, fixing our eyes on the pole star. This is so beautiful. He says, fixing our eyes on the pole star of the heard transcendental voice. If in that duty, under the guidance of Sri Guru, we are always inspired to discourse about the truth, then no hankering for travel or any veiled form of desire other than the chanting of Harinam will ever strike terror into our hearts. Wow. So yeah, so grief, um, the loss of loved ones, the loss of position, the loss of prestige, or fear of death or loss, it does strike terror into our hearts if we if we take our eyes off the prize, right? If we take our eyes, as he says, off the pole star, Dhruva, Dhruva Maharaja's planet, right? Dhruva Loka. If we take our eyes off the pole star of the herd, transcendental voice. So I was thinking, yeah, what do we hear when we chant the, the Guru Puja prayers? We're just hearing Adi Purusha probably chanting those beautiful prayers. So the devotee is praying, my only wish is to have my consciousness purified by the words emanating from your lotus mouth. How beautiful, right? So a devotee like that, her reality is beyond the world of birth and death. Um, beyond, um, yeah, my such a person, their reality is a, is a longing to hear, to understand, and to have that direct perception by realization. Yeah, Bhagavad Gita, Pratyaksha Vagamam Dharmyam, Susukam Kartam Avyayam. To directly perceive this knowledge by realization is um, is the sweetest, um, yeah, sweetest path. So yeah, so that that kind of focus would take us beyond all the he said, she says of this world, and we would not be so impacted so deeply by the daily news, right? what's happening in Ukraine or Israel or Palestine or Russia, right? So the fact is we all carry grief, sadness, loss, and it's actually good to sit with it, to recognize it, to contemplate it, and then to, and then to move through it. But honoring it authentically not repressing it or stuffing it down to become toxic, to become um, illness and toxic trauma. So there's a beautiful something that I read that it said that grief makes artists of us all. Grief causes us to reweave the loose and the undone tangled threads of our lives and to reweave them into another type of trap tapestry. Isn't that beautiful? A new type of tapestry. So to gradually, gradually um, move from the sentiment to the reality, as we see in these verses spoken by these wives of, of Kamsa. So they were actually daughters of Jarasandha. Jarasandha and Kamsa were great friends. So these are the daughters of Jarasandha who became the wives of Kamsa. And after the death of their husband Kamsa, they went back and they complained to their father, Jarasandha, that their dear husband Kamsa who was so cruelly and unfairly killed by his sworn enemy, Krishna. So they go back and forth, right? They go back and forth between their grief and their sentiments and their anger at Krishna who killed their husbands and their even their brief perception, right? Of the reality of the temporary nature of this world. So I was thinking that we ourselves actually, I speak for myself, that we ourselves are, are, are like these ladies, right? We also vacillate between sentiments and the reality of loss, 
We go back and forth like every day, maybe every moment we go back and forth. So um, yeah, as more or less beginners on the path of bhakti, we all experience this kind of wavering, um, this vacillating between being having our eyes fixed on the pole star, our goal of our devotional service, our pure love at the lotus feet of, of Krishna, right? And all our day in and day out doubts and fears and attachments, right? But I was thinking um, in Madhurya Kadambani, I don't know if any of you have read this beautiful tiny book by Viswanath Chakravarti Thakur. There's a discussion of bhajana. Um, in the second chapter, there's a description of bhajana kriya, which is different from bhajan. Bhajan means the worship of Krishna by a fixed devotee, but bhajana kriya is like the beginning when we're trying to do the work of bhajan, but we're not really doing real bhajan yet. So, uh, he gives a very clear delineation of six stages of unsteady devotional service. I think it's interesting to look at it. So, so yeah, um, this bhajana kriya will eventually, if we stick to the path, will eventually become bhajan. But sometimes a beginner, like a child, like, you know, imagine a child who just started school becomes proud that, um, you know, she he or she thinks, oh, I've, now I've mastered everything. I've learned the ABCs, and now I've just, I know everything, right? So this is called um, utsaha mai, puffed up with enthusiasm, immature enthusiasm. Um, yeah, so this is the first one, right? And then there's a next stage of unsteady devotional service. This is what, these verses reminded right. me of this one. It's called gana tarala, thick and thin. Sometimes we're negligent. Sometimes we're diligent, right? We go back and forth. We flip back and forth because we don't really have a real taste for devotional service yet. Or I could speak for myself. Maybe you do, but for myself, there's this diligent and negligent going back and forth. So this symptom of vacillating, right? Maybe I should just renounce the whole world and and go live at Radhakund, and or maybe maybe I should buy a big house in the country and have kids and make my kids Krishna conscious. So this is the third one. This is called Vyuda Vikalpa, um, vacillating between um, renunciation or how should I do this path, going back and forth between my former habits and the victory and defeat of those habits, Visaya Sagara, that's the next one. The Visaya Sagara means the ocean of sense enjoyment, right? Yeah, Nancy knows this so well as a as a sponsor in, in AA, you know? Yeah, should I go back to my old habits? You know, I was happy when I was doing that, but no, maybe I wasn't. You know, so going back and forth. So this inability to, to improve in devotional service or to follow strict rules that I impose on myself, right? Here's another one. From today, I'm only going to talk about Krishna and nothing else, right? So this is called Niyamakshama. Niyamakshama. So this is like wanting to really, really be strict, but then we fall back, right? And then finally, the last one is getting caught up in the weeds uh, that grow up around the devotional creeper. There's a bhakti creeper, right? We're trying to grow this creeper of love, trying to help it reach to the lotus of feet of Krishna and the spiritual world where it will bloom in delicious fruits and fragrant flowers of love of God. But when we get tangled up in the weeds around this creeper, we seek pleasure in the in the respect or the position or sometimes even wealth that comes along with bhakti, right? Now I'm a senior devotee, I'm a guru, I'm a sannyasi, and just delighting in the material facilities. So this is compared with diving and coming up in these tiny small waves in the ocean of, of bhakti, right? This is called Taranga Rangani. 
So yeah, all this vacillating between sentimentalism and reality that we see exemplified in these grieving wives of Kamsa. And um, yeah, as we gain strength in bhakti wisdom, we can also gain steadiness in, in the reality of devotional service. And we can learn to be grateful for the losses we experience in our lives. So, you know, Srila Prabhupada uses the word pinpricks, which I love. It's very, very wise and deep, you know, just these little pinpricks that come during my day. The he said, she said, the war, the this, the that, you know. Someone insults me, someone, um, you know, I consider someone kicks me out or whatever. So these pinpricks, these are the wake-up calls that awaken us to Krishna's living, holy name to what's real and what endures beyond this temporary body. And I just want to close with a beautiful thought that grief and gratitude are actually kindred souls. And each one of them is transient and temporary and pointing to what's been sent to us by grace. So yeah, these are a few thoughts on uh, the reality, the sentimentality, and on, on grief. So thank you all so much. And and maybe there's some uh, takeaways or reflections or some questions that some of you might have. Thank, thank you, you Rukmini Devi. Wonderful class. Thank you so much. We have so many Vaishnavis on this call. Maybe they have a reflection or a question. We have a question in the chat from Popi. Um, so she asks, Hare Krishna, how can one like me, not so fully spiritually elevated yet, think of the reality of death and live with this reality? Personally, for me, I do get stuck on the grief phase of loss that I struggle to extract the lesson that death can come anywhere and anytime to me and my loved ones. Thank you. Thank you for that deeply introspective uh, question, Popi, you know. That's the walk of bhakti. That's I'd say that's a prayer, you know. That's a prayer that each of us should keep in our hearts every day. Because the fact is, death is all around us. Loss is all around us. Maybe we lose a pet. Maybe we lose some prestige. Maybe we lose a limb. You know, maybe we lose a family member. But that those losses are all around us every day. So I think keep that, uh, you know, that pole star, like be, keep our eyes on the prize, pray to Krishna to help me be fixed in the reality and to not wander back into the weeds of, you know, of the sentimentality and illusion. But when those losses come up, it's really important to honor them with, with pause, you know, to start by taking a pause, taking a deep breath, and honor them with an authentic, um, deep meditation to not uh, repress them and to not just stuff them back down, but to honor them and to and to learn this, this bhakti wisdom step by step, and to see what uh, what I can learn. What is what is the gratitude that I can learn step by step by honoring these losses. Yeah. Thank you, Popey. That was a beautiful question. What else? See it's ya. so nice that uh, we can um, process the loss and even be grateful for it without drifting into sentimentality and the drowning in the loss. Yeah. It's very interesting. I thought it was either one, one way or the other. Yeah. But uh, there's a way where we can process and acknowledge the loss and yeah. learn from it. Yeah, without going bananas and, and losing the track. Right. And even even if it is sentimentality, to honor honor what's coming up for me, to really take a deep breath, an authentic deep breath, and honor what's coming up for me. Because it's very important. You know, sometimes we hear someone says, that cancer was the best thing that ever happened to me, or you know, that loss, because now I'm seeing things with a different eye, with a different perspective. So, you know, we run away from the losses and the pains of this world, but maybe this is the real reason why Krishna puts this, 
these pinpricks, these pains, these losses in our path so that we can come back to him really with a full heart, understanding this is not my place. This is not my eternal home, right? My mother's gone. My father's gone. You know, so many losses. And I will also leave this world, right? So what else? Any other? I see one hand up there. Hare Krishna. Um, I'm in the car. I don't know if you can hear me. Please I can hear you. Humble, please accept my humble obeisances, Mother Mini. Um, I, I, I very much appreciate the wording to say sentimental romanticism. <laughs> um, I was in, uh, I had the privilege to be in a group with Mahatma Das Prabhu and his wife. And we were discussing that, you know, age old are women less intelligent than men and the statement um, or the concept that women have so much genuine heart and hope and optimism that they just want to offer and see the best in everyone and how that can be a romanticism that leads us astray. Mm -hmm. um, I also think, um, well, we can't, sorry, I'm driving past the track trail. Um, can you tell me your name? The, can, can you tell me your name? Sorry, uh, you would have remembered me as Michelle Berger, but I have since been initiated by a Vaisheshika Prabhu, so it is Mongo and Chitra Say your name, say your initiated name again. Uh, um, can you say your initiated name again? So, We're losing her a little bit, but her name is Mangala Chitra Devi Das. Mangala wow. Chitra. What a beautiful name. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so another thought I have is that when we say my father, my job, my home, we're giving an attachment and taking an ownership to something that is not ours. Mm -hmm. Whereas when we say Krishna's child, mm -hmm. Krishna's home, we realize it was never ours in the first place. Mm -hmm. And if it's not ours, it can't really be taken away from us. <laughs> and so, you know, that's a level of at a point, it's romanticism until it becomes realized. But once it does, I think it really helps us understand things are placed in my care for a time, but that doesn't mean they're mine to always keep. Beautiful, yeah. For, for me, that's very much helped with the I lost. Beautiful. Thank you, I'm sorry for talking so long. Thank you, that was beautiful. You know, you were so wise when you were Michelle and. And now your wisdom is going deeper and deeper. So congratulations on your initiation. And and yeah, you know, that's that's really a beautiful meditation. These are Krishna's children for me to raise. This is Krishna's home for me to use in his service. I'm cooking dinner for Krishna, right? You know, all of those um, shifts are, are beautiful ways of, yeah. Yeah, this, this audit is not coming from IRS. It's coming from Krishna. Krishna is auditing me. Right. right. This right. ticket is from Krishna. This parking ticket is from him. That's He's right. Pranking me. Yeah, yeah, you know, I heard this story. I I I heard the story the other day that uh 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 Barka Shardas Babaji Maharaj, when he was on his way to the to uh his follow his nature call in the forest, some boys were throwing rocks at him, and he was so Krishna conscious that he was saying, Krishna. If you don't stop throwing rocks at me, I'm going to have to tell Mother Yasoda on you. So, yeah, even even the rocks, what, what to speak of pinpricks, big rocks. So, yeah, I see Bhima Das has a hand up. And Ananda Manjari. Ananda Manjari, Ananda Manjari also has her hand up. Okay, Ananda Manjari. And she has an awe and reverence emoji popping up. Well, no, I was just very... Um inspired to hear the story of Gordas Ababaji. <laughs> Krishna Arukini Walker Prabhu. Um, I wanted to reflect 
on the point that is is simple and yet profound for me and a, and a big takeaway from this class which is simply that um that every point of advancement is reflected in the in how steady we are and so that steadiness in our practices or in our character and in, in our expressions of in devotional service are actually you know that that um resonance of of the advancement of the heart and i find it to be just incredible because it's it's beautiful to hear that this is something that we just cannot forego like it absolutely has to happen we just absolutely have to become steady um so thank you so much thank you and to not beat ourselves up when when we're not so steady because by practice um we become more steady right by practicing, it becomes a uh, second nature. So people sometimes say, oh, I'll never be able to chant 16 rounds. That'll be impossible. But, you know, by practice, it becomes possible. So to, you know, to to have that air, that perspective, that vantage point, even on my unsteadiness, to not be beating myself up over it, but just keep keep walking step, step by step, gradually, gradually. Yeah. Okay. So should we go to, should we honor one gentleman here and take a question from Bhima or a reflection from Bhima Prabhu? Bhima Prabhu, go ahead. See, he's taking off his gloves. He can't press the button in the gloves. Use your nose, Bhima Prabhu. <laughs> and give up your beard. Give up your beard. Give up your it's, beard it's, and self-importance. <laughs> Even if you're a woman without a beard, right? <laughs> uh, this is not Bhima. This is Bhima Devi Dasi speaking here <laughs> in, a, in a deep voice. Um, I just want to very quickly, since this is um, a class for the fairer uh, uh, amongst us, um, that... You're also uh, fair. We are <laughs> to fair. my horses. <laughs> to my horses, um, that uh, your mention that grief makes artists of us all. Mm. And <clears throat> that really struck me because, um, uh, um, you know, when we are grieving or when we are in pain, um, when we are threatened, when we think we might lose something, that is about the time, at least for myself, <clears throat> that we uh, stand still enough to contemplate and to, and to introspect into what has brought me to this. And how is Krishna trying to teach me something here? Um, what is Krishna saying to me? You know, we, we, we take for granted all that we should rather be grateful for, but grief makes us stand still and reminds us as artists, to stand still and pay close attention as an artist does who paints, he pays very close attention to the hues and to perspective and to uh, shading, the subtle shading in our life that helps us to grow. And we have faith, <clears throat> if we have faith in Krishna, we can understand that Krishna is painting a picture for us mm -hmm. and he's writing a poet poem such as the song of God, he's telling us <clears throat> in no uncertain terms that he is worth coming home to and that, and that he is all around us and he's within us and within our heart and he's there in our grief and that if we just are still enough like an artist and pay close enough attention like an artist, then we will understand that that, that grief is actually a blessing. Never was I so m more blessed than by the onslaught of COVID and the closing down of my business for two years and having nothing to do, being so absorbed in running around, trying to divert my attention away from the finer things, such as Krishna consciousness, I was forced to pay attention and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Wow. Uh, so thank you very much for this class. Hare Krishna. You, Bhima Das, you are really an artist and a poet. Thank you. How beautiful. Thank you. Stephanie, you have your hand up. Hare Krishna, Rukmini. Glad to be here this morning. It is early here in Salt Lake City. 
Um, but uh, one of the realizations that I had is I'm going through uh, the trauma Karuna care classes right now, and it's brought up some stuff from before I can even remember. Um, and so I know I know that some of where where my chronic pain sits, and it would be so much easier to just forget and walk away. But I know I know that's not possible because my body is going to keep reminding me but it just helps me remember how much courage it takes to work through whatever we're going through and to sit with whatever we're going through and a lot of people in this world don't want to do that so I just want to applaud anybody who's going through something and uh, dealing with grief and everything that way uh, applaud you for your strength and courage and and just I'm feeling that myself that Krishna is offering me the strength that I need and he's there for all of us but keep going because uh, courage has to be there but Krishna is right with us thank you oh, beautiful Sharmila can I ask you Sharmila and uh, grief and loss is so personal to me that uh, that um all I could do, it was so severe that all I could do was to pray to Krishna earnestly to send help. And he did send help. And it was in your form, for which I'm eternally grateful. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Sharmila. So you are so grateful. Bruce, Bruce, you have your hand up. Ooh, Hare Krishna. Thank you for such a beautiful class. You mentioned this is sticking with me a lot in being the observer. At what point, especially with our loved ones, when we are trying to be the observer, and this is coming from a new understanding of this position, at what point do we, sometimes, you know, they'll inflict pain upon us or criticize us or give us harsh words at what point do we say enough and not be that observer? And, you know, because we don't, I've learned that we don't want to hurt others because in fact that hurts Krishna and it hurts our bhakti. At wh wh where is that line? That line is so gray. Yeah. And, you know, that that's my question. And I've been struggling with this and I'm sure I can imagine others do as well. So I'm just wondering if you have any, practical insight on this for us or for me yeah thank you very very deep and important point yeah you know sometimes you have to uh, take a little break from those people who just want to be combative you know sometimes you have to step away and then come back you know understand that that combative um, mood that they're firing at you um, it's coming from their own place of pain right so sometimes you just have to take some space, sometimes physical space, sometimes some time, and then come back because people, you know, people, uh, people who are suffering can can really be combative. Um, I know when my mother was dying, actually just before she died, the morning she was dying, she called. Me, I was on my way to the assisted living where she was, and she called me up and she said, "You're not here for me." You're not here to help me. You're just here for yourself. I was at the drugstore getting some uh, laxative medicine that she had asked for. And uh, so, yeah, you know, so sometimes people are just carrying their own pain. And we just have to, like, honor it, take a deep breath, and honor that I'm coming from a place of giving, a place of love as best I can. And, uh, you know, pray to Krishna for that person. And sometimes that person can also get help by Krishna's grace. So I hope that's helpful. Very much so. Thank you so much. Thank you.